we all were thrown into a, an unknown territory. All of the time, we found ourselves into some major, major uh, 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 changes. I'm talking about everyone in the, in the entire world. Welcome to Academically Distanced, a series of discussions with people from all across FSU on their experiences in academia during the time of COVID. I'm Tom Cruise, Digital Media Manager at FSU Libraries, and in this episode, I'm joined by Juan Carlos Galeano, a poet, translator, environmentalist, and professor of Spanish American poetry and cultures of Amazonia at Florida State University. We are sitting to this kind of a space where we start thinking about thinking about our lives. We live in a fragmented world, you know. It, that's pretty much our our human condition in in, in Western societies, right? I mean, we don't live in a communal life or anything like that. To me, that was this space for reflection was prompted by the kind of situations that uh, are in the case of a war uh, situation. I love Italian uh, poetry, 20th century poetry that I, you know, I read when I was an adolescent in Espanol, in Spanish. And I remember this great Italian poet, Ungaretti. He, he was a soldier in the First World uh, War. And he wrote this very powerful compelling po uh, point in which the, the, the subject of the poem is that that he's at the trenches with another soldier, a friend of his, who is dead. And, and he says that in that moment of death, he has never felt so close to life. He has written love poems that night. Hmm. And uh, so you see, I mean, this is how a, a, a limit situation throws us into the, these, these spaces. And that's what I thought. So then I started in my classes, you know, since I had a conversational class, I asked my students, tell us about how this first weekend, week when at home with your families. What was new? What kind of new conversations came up different than the ones that you had? Uh, before in your regular visits to your family. And uh, so all kinds of narratives came up out of that. And uh, and we we all kind of start sharing the burden, you know, because at the same time I have narratives for them. Uh, and those were narratives that are coming from the Amazon basin. My, my indigenous friends were um, experiencing the, the arrival of the pandemic there. And, uh, and who had it terrible. You don't need to be a philosopher to be situated before the big questions of life, to have different kind of conversations with your mother, with your uh, friends, with your uh, uh, classmates. Like, like you say, we, we live it in a very fragmented way here, um, but there, there are many who, who would seek normalcy even where there is none. So I think that that practice of engaging with your students and allowing you know, everything that is happening around them to remain relevant, you know, just because we're in the classroom doesn't mean that we've escaped from, you know, reality, so to speak. Yeah, <laughs> even though our, our, our political leaders um, were telling us that everything was, was fine and uh, everything was great and that, that very soon, you know, that next month that uh, everything was going to be normal and, uh, you know, uh, no. There was, there was some there was some reality that we all were being hit with in this unknown territory, you know, territorio desconocido, terreno desconocido. I mean, uh, we didn't know, we didn't know. I mean, and, and we were, I remember being very obsessed about following all the advice. You know, I remember, uh, you know, upon arriving to, to my door, taking my shoes, uh, uh, you know, getting my clothes to the washing machine. I mean, doing all kinds of things. Spending two, three hours um, uh, cleaning the, the 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 produce and the things that we bought at the store. I know that that happens to a lot of people. You know, because we we didn't know. Uh, we didn't know. I observed that because I stayed here. I remember going to the store like every three weeks or something like that. And, and I stayed here at home, which prompted other things. I mean, I started uh, focusing on my garden. 
you know that's something that I that I have done since I was uh, um, uh, a little one. I, I grew up with uh, you know my uh, grandparents in a farm, and, and, and uh, they were settlers. And my parents in in the Colombian Amazon, and um, so there is a lot of uh, working with the land, uh, working your hand with your hands, which really throws you into a different kind of relationship and with the earth. Gardening here, living in the United States, has been my way to connect to the land, to the earth here, because I am an immigrant. And, uh, and I spent quite a bit uh, of time in, the, in, in Latin America, and uh, in, specifically in the Amazon basin. Uh, uh, working with uh, communities, organizations, and groups of students who go there to do internships in NGOs that uh, focus on um, food security projects and things like that. So, and 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 those are very relevant to me because uh, I um, I still work with those organizations uh, when I direct programs uh, of American students in the in the Amazon. Since I couldn't go to the gym anymore, you know to. Uh, to um, to swim is that that's basically what I do uh, for exercise, gardening and uh, you know making my garden much bigger, uh, coming up with new sites and and not using a tiller, just you know uh, breaking down the soil and and I remember even sharing uh, with my Amazonian friends uh, you know what I was doing, the, the plants that I was planting here. And, uh, you know, this is the paradox that it brought us to this isolation, but it created spaces, it created sites for new connectedness, connectedness with ourselves, with others here and somewhere else. I found myself talking to friends of mine, uh, friends of mine from childhood who live in Europe now or who live in other parts of Latin America, or who live in the, you know, in the town where I was born. An environmentalist um, friend of mine, um, Sir Nayovino, commented upon <laughs> when we were talking about Amazonia, uh, she was saying how we, uh, humankind, our species, had been a coronavirus for other species. It's a... Uh, <laughs> It's true. Yeah. yeah it's it, true. It I invites mean, that perspective, doesn't it? So it, it certainly became that, that time for, for humility and, and reflection for those who could afford it. For those who could afford it, that's, 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 very, that's very important. What you just said, because we are privileged, we were able to afford that. A lot of, a lot of people in the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, die during this pandemia. Uh, because of the lack of medicines. I was, I was witnessing a lot of it because I was in, on a daily basis in contact with uh, the people in the, in the Amazon, indigenous friends, and uh, you know, making sure that uh, there were enough medicines for whenever coronavirus was gonna hit a family and uh, several friends die. Uh, other friends survive, and I was I was uh, on a daily basis with them uh, through their uh, experiencing the the, uh, the 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 illness, and you know, hearing about their fears. You know, oh, last night I thought that I was gonna die. I mean. That is very compelling. That that is, it's you know. Today I'm feeling better, and but tomorrow the person, uh, you know, will feel like he's gonna die. So going like that for 20 days, you know, 15, 20 days, uh, with two friends of mine, the people that I work with uh, down there. So that which was an abstraction. Uh, there was, because uh, to many of us here, because of that privileged circumstance in which we live that you just mentioned, you know, you s see it on the news or, you know, and see those numbers. So it sort of becomes an abstraction a little bit. And, uh, 
Uh, but it's different between, you know, a close friend of yours who lives in another town or nearby tells you what he is experiencing and that he's, he doesn't know if he's going to live or not. And you are just telling the person how important he is that he can die. That's that's the way I I found myself with two friends of mine, Edward Wakachi Coral, this is an indigenous Amazonian, and Herman Ruiz Abecasis, the director of Alpawayo Michana National Reserves. The person who was going to come to present, uh, he got coronavirus because since he is engaged with so many communities there, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. For one month, he was helping people and carrying people with coronavirus in his in his truck. You know, transporting food, making and medicines, making sure that uh, this will arrive in that community up river or down the river on a daily basis. And he was telling me, uh, I don't know when is he gonna hit me because you know uh, somebody that I was uh, with uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, he has coronavirus and that person will die. And uh, so eventually he got it because of the, the uh, amount of the viral uh, charge. That was, the, that, that, that was, he's a biologist, so he, yeah. that was his explanation. So finally he got it and he was, he was close, I mean, to, to death. And he was telling me, uh, I, I didn't answer the phone. I didn't text you back because I, you know, I couldn't sleep last night, and I thought I was gonna die. And I, and I, I, I just today I, I just crashed, and he was just going like that, you know, every day for almost three weeks. And uh, so, what can I do before that, in front of that situation, just to tell him how important he is? and he can die because he is so important to that place. He has been uh, politically engaged throughout the years, defending that place, engaging so much fight there uh, for the Amazon. And, uh, and, and he survived and, and he's, he's, he was back again in, in the fight. I mean, it's it's almost as your your friend put it, and, and to to put himself in in front of so much risk and and have that acceptance of when, not if. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, while doing so much to to help within his own community, um, you know, it's it's just not. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, b being very very Eurocentric of me, but it's definitely not the way it's seen here. Um, and it is that that intense abstraction that that makes us forget how how life or death this is, especially for for folks who are not as as privileged. Um, yeah. To to so I, I think that that point of view that you bring and that that your friends uh, bring is is something that's that I'm really thankful to to have um, you know you here for for this conversation. And um, I was hoping you could uh, fill me in a little bit about the the background of of the the Amazon, the river, your work um, along there, and you know why why do you have these these strong connections there, both through your work and life? I was born in the Colombian Amazon, although I I have uh, grown in the small uh, farms there and small villages. I had a strong connection with the uh, indigenous people and the ways of life there. My, my parents were uh, were uh, white mestizo people that came, you know, to uh, settle in that place. They came uh, uh, fleeing from a, a civil war in Colombia that went on uh, in the 50s and 60s. And so that place was very important in my life. I always wanted to write about it. I started writing poetry. And when I came to the States, I, I, I wrote my dissertation, I wrote a book on uh, poetry of violence. So I sort of didn't write, didn't publish, I would say, anything in connection to Amazonia like for 15 years. I kept writing, but I kept it to myself. It was when I came to Florida State that I, uh, as an assistant professor uh, in 1995, 
that I decided to go every summer going to all the countries that share the Amazon basin and start uh, traveling and spending time with hunters, loggers, uh, fishermen, many fishermen and, and shamans. Shamans were very important in order to listen to their uh, oral narratives, folk tales about the way they went about their daily lives in the forests and in rivers. At the beginning, I thought I was going to be a, a two-year project, you know, a couple of summers, you know, researcher goes, you know, to a place and interviews people and come back and write a book. But really, from day one, I knew it was going to be longer and I haven't left the place. Those sort of narratives ended up influencing the way I write my poetry, my teaching. I started teaching more and more courses on, 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 on Amazonia and became engaged in, in so many projects uh, throughout my life in connection to the place. I was invited to collaborate with the FSU Film School uh, uh, back in 2005 to uh, do a documentary film that is called The Trees Have a Mother that is on the uh, spiritual ecology of Amazonians, um, the religiosity. So I became more connected to the Peruvian Amazon because that was the site that was chosen back then to do our documentary, uh, The Trees Have a Mother, uh, which is distributed by Film for the Humanities and Sciences, um, and, it's, and it's used in a variety of, of fields. I, I became very engaged and involved with um, indigenous organizations of the Peruvian Amazon. I, um, I collaborated uh, throughout the year, throughout the past 15 years in, in so many things, uh, so many projects, educational projects. A lot of indigenous people are, are very close friends, are like, like family to me. And uh, in fact, um, uh, one of them, and this is all <laughs> connected to the to the situation. We're going back to the situation now. Uh, he had gone. Uh, who is a, who has been a, a, in in the two films? His name is Walter um, Arimuya Wanakiri. Uh, he's a um, Kukama Kukamiria uh, indigenous person. Uh, very very knowledgeable about uh, rivers of the Amazon. I. I can't think of anyone in the entire base in Brazilian Amazon, Venezuela Amazon, uh, you know, that knows more about the rivers and fish uh, than this man and his family. He's one of the characters in the in the in the in the film El Rio. He, who is a person who can't live without being in the water, got stuck in Lima. He had gone to some exams to Lima just like regular checkup, you know. He was stuck in the apartment of one of his daughters who lives there every day, every day since March. This so, was during their lockdown. Right, mm -hmm. right. He just went back two weeks ago. He was allowed to go back. There were no flights, no flights to, uh, you know, a, a, Iquitos is in the center of the Peruvian Amazon, you know. So he was locked there in that apartment and uh so and we he and i you know have been close friends for the past 15 years so we start talking almost every day th for the past three months about plants animals about the river so we were just like we went back to childhood uh, uh, talking about our lives about you know because we grew up in different places talking about plants and and, and animals and uh yeah i find myself you know for an hour, almost every day. It has been my experience that almost uh, every time from negative experiences, from the bad, it prompts uh, other things that uh, because we, we adapt as a species, we adapt and, 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 and find uh, ways to um, not only to survive, but, but to uh, 
to come up with other things. While we are trapped in these trenches, surrounded by death, we write love poems. Exactly. That is, it's, it's interesting that you, that is stuck with you because it is stuck with me since I was 18 years old. But it became so strongly present when we were hit the first month with the pandemic. Without even having having read the poem, like the, the, the gravity of that, that image and that thought yeah. It feels so important now. Um, and I mean, thinking aloud, it's it's not even a matter of, of forgetting where you are or forgetting what's happening around you. But it's like you said, it's it's rediscovering the value of these things, of, of life and, and love in the midst of it. Like you've, yeah. you've found ways to, to reintroduce that, you know, to, you know, even yeah. your students, like in the midst of all this, what how, how are you speaking differently to your family? What new thoughts come to you? I think that... This pande- uh, pandemia, this coronavirus, created some kind of disconnect from the big machine for all of us that allowed those spaces. You know, I found myself talking to my mother and to my family, having conversations that I didn't have before about details. Uh, of life as a child with my brothers and sisters and with my mother that I wouldn't have had otherwise, mm. you know, during the times when I regularly call them to say hello, we talk about other things all these years, but we never revisit, had time for uh, visiting uh, some, some of those experiences. We adapt and, and, and look for the new possibilities, I guess, uh, is my hope that when we come back to that normalcy, if we ever... A new normal. A new normal, exactly, that we have learned something about us, about our relationship to others. We can only hope, right? I mean, it's it's part of our makeup, I think. It it has... It feels so d- disruptive in, in many ways, you know, a, a pandemic, you know, striking us all at this same time. And it, it's like you say that there is there is hope and we're seeing some of it that the kind of disruption that can come from it will be productive, will be in the form of growth. Um, and we see, you know, so many people who are taking up activism, uh, whether it be in the form of, you know, Black Lives Matter or like generally just bringing uh platform to hear you know black and indigenous peoples of color their voices to the forefront also taking the time to to be able to reflect and say not anymore um if we go back to a new normal it can't be like it was yeah exactly tom not anymore and what we are seeing now is a reaction to that that came along uh with with the pandemia and the circumstances that that he uh, created, all of a sudden we are in a totally different space. You know, in a way that's a, a sort of like a religious space, a space for for thinking. And I wonder if that will be these times will be remembered that way. You know, we are too busy now. We are on board. We are traveling on board of this. So we can reflect much about the, the moment. It's funny, having spent so much time separated from what we once called normal to, to an extent where we can look back and say, was normal really all that good? How much do I really miss about that? And us being able to come together and decide, you know what, if we go back, I want it to be this way. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think, Tom, that this is one of the greatest things that I'm taking from this conversation. <laughs> that sentence of yours right there, when you said, do I really want to be that way? And you know what? I think about that. You know why? Because we were here and, you know, since it was warm, I would just, you know, place my hammock and the evenings uh, were spent 
differently uh, than I would have spent my other days being part of the big machine that you and I are in which we can stop to think that much. I hope, I hope that this disruption brings uh, the creation of a, of a new normalcy. And I want to think that since life is made of both good and bad, I want to think that this bad can bring a lot of good. And I think, you know, with that, you've, thank you so much <laughs> for... It's been a pleasure to uh, talk to you. And, it, and it, was, it was truly my, my pleasure to host you, and it, it meant a lot for you to be able to, to take the time to, to join me here. And um, please do, uh, while you're there, continue to write poetry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Sure.